Hey guys, these may look like common uh, guns, at least for our channel they're pretty common, but in fact, these are rare variations. Stay tuned. You might want to try to stay awake until the bitter end because I'm going to show you this one last. It happens to be the rarest one, only about 4,000 made. Now it might look like a high standard, but in fact, it's a Fiala. I bet you've never heard of a Fiala. The first one I want to discuss at length is this Walther PP. It's from 1938 and it's actually a rare five digit serial number. Now, I think a lot of you probably never even knew that they made a wartime or pre Pre-World War II, they made a five-digit. Uh, let's take a look at it by uh, first checking out, uh, in my book on SS Contract Walders, I do have a list of serial numbers. Let's take a look. Okay, production started in 1929, and it started at 750,000 on the P PPs. It was always six digits. Most of you uh, think you know that it went from 750,000 all the way up to 999,000 and then it, um, they went back to 100,000 and added the P. That's actually, uh, we know from PPKs, started at 750,000, actually a little bit after that. And then went all the way up to 999,000 uh, and then it went to a million, and this is actually goes to a million six hundred thousand. So uh, you know about the million series, and they made about six six thousand of the million series. But many of you did not know that for a short period of time they had a five-digit serial number. Let's take a look at one. Now there are only about a thousand of these. They went from ninety-eight thousand to ninety-nine thousand, and they added the P. So basically, they dropped a digit and added a P, and this is considered a five-digit. Now I need to explain a little bit further that this I'm talking about Zellamelis Thurigan Factory or Turrigan Factory. Some of you will write to me and say, I have a five digit and it's post-war. It'll have a different letter after it. I'm not talking about anything from the Ohm factory. Now I get emails every day saying, can you tell me more about my gun? And I only specialize in guns before 1946. Anything that's post-war, I really don't pay any attention to. So often people will send me something and say, when was my gun made and who did it go to? But it's from the, uh, right here it'll say Ohm factory. Here, actually, it's right here. You see on the slide, if it says Ohm, it's post-war. Uh, the Zellamelis factory was actually blown up uh, by the Russians. First, it was occupied by the United States, but it was in the Russian sector, so we turned it over to them. Uh, the, the factory had already been fully pillaged, but it was then blown up, destroyed. Uh, so the Walder family opened a new factory in Ulm. So if your gun is marked Ulm, it means it's post-war, and I really can't tell you much about it. Uh, often, and if you look at the ejection port, you can see right there there's a two-digit number. That tells you the year it was born. So instead of asking, just take a look in that chamber, and if you see like 67 or 68, that means that that's the year that it was made. But let's get to back to this gun, which is the gun we're talking about. So this is a commercial gun, and it is, um, I, I already mentioned, they only made about a thousand of these, and it's a five digit, it's a rare five digit uh, with a P at the end. Uh, there are some that are marked SA here, uh, and there are some in the uh, five digit range that are NSKK marked here. So the, some of them will have an NSKK, some of them are SA. This one, however, is just a commercial gun. It, uh, because it's 1938, it'll be crown and proofed, and uh, it will have a Walder Banner magazine. Uh, so it's just a really nice example, a little bit of wear on the grip straps, which is common. This is dulled down a bit, but the most important part is the five digit. All of the other ones you see will be six digit if it's before 1946. Okay, here's a pretty common gun, don't you think? Uh, it looks like a World War I era gun. Uh, but in fact, uh, this gun is from 1913. It does have the military inspection. It's early enough to have the lanyard loop. It's got the dual tone magazine lanyard loop on the bottom. It's got wooden grips, so it's the World War I era. 1913 is actually pre-World War I, of course. But what makes this one special, and most of you would have known this right away because it says right there, U.S. Navy. It also has a five-digit serial number. 
uh, and again 1913. It has an early feature, which is a half, uh, what they call a half moon rear sight. Um, most of them after 1913, uh, well, starting in 1914, it'll have a rectangular sight, as you can see here. The barrel, which has a pretty nice bore, is PH marked, which is correct. And usually the slide, you can barely see it. The slide is not numbered, by the way, but there is an H right here as well, hard to see. Uh, so those are just some of the uh, nuances of the very early guns. So five digit uh, serial range in the 40,000 range, if you go to a uh, website, well actually the Colt website, uh, uh, Colt Archives will at least date it for you, but there's also a website that we use a lot, proofhouse.com. You can look this up and it'll say it was made in 1913, uh, one of only about 6,000 guns that went to the US Navy, making this a pretty rare gun. And uh, the condition is really nice. Most of the Navy weapons, just like German Navy weapons, are pretty pitted um, because of the salt air that they were exposed to. This one has some brown patina, which is actually something you like to see on an old gun. It's well over 100 years old. Uh, this one is in uh, remarkable condition. It's actually uh, worthy of my safe. Speaking of Colts, this is a pretty common design. You'll see this in the 1903, the Model 1903, and the Model 1908. The 08 is in 38 caliber, or 380, I should say, excuse me, 380. Uh, this is in 32 caliber. It's a, a Model 1903. Uh, the only thing that makes this one remarkable is how early it is. Uh, you'll notice it, it has the barrel bushing, which is only found in the earliest models. This is also a uh, fire blue, but it's kind of faded. What's, uh, where the fire blue is really, uh, well, it really stands out is here, here, grip screw, the ejector. See all the fire blue? Um, even behind here, there's a little bit of fire blue. I'm going to go like that so it sparkles. But the little fire blue um, uh, throughout the small parts. And then you see this scalloped grip. Uh, the Colt logo is scalloped, and that's an early variation. And finally, the Colt logo has the uh, circle around it. So it's just a really early variation, which makes it rare. And these can easily go for double or more than double uh, the cost of, a, of a, uh, your typical 1903, Model 1903 uh, uh, semi-automatic pistol. Uh, so that makes this one a good find. Again... Uh, worthy of my safe. There are a few scratches on it, so it's not perfect, but again, it's over 100 years old. Okay, this is obviously a Polish radium. Uh, actually, we call it a radium in the United States, but in much of Europe and definitely in Poland, they call it the Viz. That's actually the model, the Viz. The Germans called it the P35. Uh, Americans call it radiums. I don't, I'm not sure why, other than it was made in, in uh, the town of uh, the factory is in radium and Poland. Uh, and what makes this one unusual is the Polish Eagle. Now they only made about 30,000 of them before the war broke out. In, uh, in 1938 they made about 10,000. And so that, that's really low production compared to overall during World War II and up until the end they made uh, a couple hundred thousand Polish radiums. We did a, a video recently where the Germans surrender and we showed you this big pile of weapons and I, I mentioned as you go through that pile and you look at it, even under magnification, I, I saw a surprising number of radium rigs, holsters, and, and this surrender took place in Denmark in 1945. They were, they were using a lot of Polish radiums. Uh, but during the war, uh, the ones made by the Germans looked like this. It, they, of course, removed the Polish eagle and instead uh, put on a, a, their own logo with some Waffen stamps, Waffen 77, along with a Waffen 623, which was uh, because they were put together at the Steyr factory. But this is uh, considered a three lever. When the Germans uh, made them, they also used the three lever, but little by little, they cut back on the quality. They removed some of the fa safety features and they finally came uh, toward the end, they were uh, doing phosphate finish with wooden grips. Here's an example of that. They're actually very popular as well. But going back to this one, this is a Polish Radom Eagle. These are getting extremely hard to find. I used to go to shows and see one or two of them at every show, and I'd always uh, squabble on buying them, meaning I didn't want to pay the price. And today, 
I would snatch them up in a minute for some of the prices. Uh, well, I was turning them down at 3,000, 4,000. Now you will see them at 5,000, 6,000, even uh, 8,500, 9,000, uh, just because of the rarity and the popularity. The, the Polish factory made a, a beautiful uh, weapon, uh, which was very smooth, very reliable, and uh, popular, uh, even among the snooty Germans who felt like everything they had uh, everything they made was so much better. Uh, some of the proof marks that stand out on the uh, magazine, on the bottom of the magazine it has a G2 proof, and then here you see a D, D2 proof. Those are the uh, Polish proof marks, and most importantly, the uh, Polish eagle, which was the symbol of their country. Okay, here's the final frontier. This is a Fiala. Now, I had never heard of one of these when he brought it in. I thought, what the heck is it? And I think that's what you're going to say. And when you see how this works, I think you'll be truly amazed because it is not what you think. Not at all what you think. Let's take a closer look. Okay, we'll start off with, um, this is the sales sheet. It is in 22 caliber. It's considered the 1920. Now, uh, the model 1920, and that's because they started making it in 1920. They only made it up until 1923, and they only made about 4,000 of them. And I would say they were not well received. A uh, company went out of business. They made a few more from parts after 1923, but generally the real ones, uh, this one is one of the real ones. It has Fiala arms, and it has a picture of a polar bear. We'll talk about that. It's an, uh, it, it does look like a high standard made in the USA. It's actually made in New Haven, Connecticut. We know a lot of guns were made out of New Haven, Connecticut. And you do see the model number here. Uh, it has the long barrel. It is meant to be a target pistol. Uh, now going back to the sales sheet, we can see that it came actually with just one receiver. So there was one frame and three separate barrels that would screw on. Um, and actually, uh, Ian, uh, there's a video here. He's at Rock Island. This is 2015. He has the uh, rifle barrel, uh, which is 20 inches. Uh, this is seven and a half inches and considered the, the, the target pistol. Uh, so he has one of each of these, and this comes with a buttstock. Uh, we just talked about carbines, and, and actually this uh, leather carrying case. You can see the leather carrying case and suitcase reminds me of one we just did. And that was, uh, this one was a, a, a leather case for a carbine Luger, a 1920 carbine Luger. And that looks a lot like what they sold here for $3. Uh, this would cost a lot more than $3, $3 today. So um, just so you understand, it comes with one receiver, three barrels, and one buttstock. And there's the price, a whopping uh, 3250 in 1920. So, and the advertising said three for the price of one. So another interesting part of this story is the polar bear. Uh, the Fiala was um, actually, it was invented by the same guy. The patent was from the same guy that uh, patented the high standard. The high standard is, in my opinion, a huge, huge improvement over this particular gun. But Anthony Fiala, uh, who was an American from Italian descent, he was a Arctic explorer. He was actually famous as the, at the time. His name was well known. He actually did some exploration of the Amazon with Theodore Roosevelt, uh, but he was most famous for his Arctic trips. And so people knew him as an Arctic explorer. He lent his name uh, to the production of this gun. They thought that this would help with the sales. Now, I, I read in one of the articles about this gun uh, the reason it works the way it does, it, it looks like it would be semi-automatic, especially since it has a 10-shot a magazine. So you would think it would be semi-automatic. In fact, it's, uh, it operates as a single-shot 22 caliber target pistol. That's right. If, uh, here's how it works. It works the opposite of the way you would think. This is a lever that would release the slide, but the slide just comes back very simply. Push this down, although I find this was sharp, not with my gloves on, but um, I found that to be a little bit sharp. Pull that back very easily. So the spring tension only comes into play when you push it forward. So when you push it forward, that cocks it. So it basically works opposite. Before we do that, down here you can see it is rim fire. There's the firing pin, and there's the ejector right there. So it does eject the bullet, but it doesn't 
automatically reload the next. And I, I actually have some dummy rounds I want to show you. I just think this, so th this whole thing is so screwed up. It doesn't make no sense uh, how they even sold 4,000 of these things. But um, the reason, okay, so there, I closed it. That was pretty tight. So once it's pushed forward, it's, it's fully cocked. And then the only, uh, actually, if there was a, a round in it, it would eject the uh, shell. And pull this down and it now it has a spring to it but without it being cocked there's the cock there is no spring in it so this provides the spring uh, you fire it i don't want to dry fire it i'm going to put a, a round in it here in a second a dummy round i should clarify and now it has a spring it is spring loaded and that ejects the bullet but it doesn't load the next one now i started to say i read this i find this hard to believe but they said the reason that um, this isn't semi-automatic is they found uh, that he found in the Arctic that the uh, semi-automatic pistols would freeze up. And so he deliberately didn't want as many moving parts. It could have been made in semi-automatic, but he made it in single shot because he found it was more reliable. Now, what I've found in my experience, this will defend you against a polar bear. This 22 caliber single shot will defend you against a polar bear under these circumstances. You bring along a partner, and when the polar bear approaches you, what you do is you shoot your partner in the leg, and then you run like hell. Now, the reason you want to shoot them in the leg is because then they're going to squirm a little bit, and you know how a worm on a hook, it attracts the fish? Well, the polar bear will immediately then be attracted to your partner, and you get away. So that is how this gun will save you from a polar bear. All right, and I know that was poor taste. Uh, some of you guys saw, knew that joke was coming because you've probably heard it before. One of my favorite jokes. So I did put some dummy rounds in this. Let me show you. There we have the 22 caliber, and again, it, it will hold 10 rounds. I'm not sure how well this will load. Okay, I took my gloves off because they're getting caught up in this mechanism, and this is sharp, but um, I load this in by pulling this forward, and then it does fire. And then this does not eject back, but it single fires. And so then you go like this, pops back, and it just ejected. Let me do that again. Actually, what I find, maybe it's the magazine is not good. This actually works a lot better if you just single load it. Push this forward. Pop it open, and you see it ejects. Um, yeah, you're thinking I'm not using it properly, but I did read and it says that it's a non-semi-automatic single, single shot target pistol. My guess is that this magazine is not feeding properly and that does look like 22 long. All right, I'm going to try this one more time. There's the bullet. We push this forward. That, that actually went in just fine. It's, it is tight. Then you fire. Push, pull down, pull that back, ejects it. See if we get one more in there kind of awkwardly. Fire. <laughs> Got to switch hands. Yeah, you don't want to do this with a polar bear coming at you. Okay, I apologize to the Fiala family if I goobered this whole thing up, but I didn't like the mechanics of this, and it could be because I'm an imbecile and doing it wrong, but it does seem very awkward, and I don't get, the, I, I don't get any idea why you would have a, a 10-shot magazine only to do single-fire um, loading. Uh, I think we should have Randy, cameraman, uh, I think we should have Randy take this to the range and try to shoot it. What do you guys think? If you're with me, Let's say, let's go Randy. I want to see how this thing works in, uh, with a real bullet. He'll probably have to single, uh, single load it. But this is not a gun that you would buy to shoot. This is a gun that a collector would buy because it is a collectible piece. A gun that they probably thought was a good idea at the time, but not so much. Rare variations that you thought you knew.